Jefes de Estado. Heads of State and of Government, distinguished ministers, your excellencies, Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General, my dear friends, it is for me a genuine honor to welcome you all to the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly. Welcome to the only place where a meeting of this kind is possible. Only this assembly, as the main deliberative and re representative body of the United Nations, offers to all the peoples and leaders of the world the opportunity to hear and be heard on an equal footing. Your Excellencies, the contribution made by the United Nations to humanity has been immense. International law, the promotion of peace, human rights, protection standards for the environment, the sustainable development goals, and those preeminent principles that govern international coexistence were born in this very General Assembly. The reality is that the work of the United Nations is as relevant today as it was 73 years ago. Multilateralism stands alone as the only viable response to the global problems that we are faced with. To undermine multilateralism or to cast a doubt upon its merits will only lead to instability and division, to mistrust and polarization. Around the world, millions of people are suffering from violence, war, from want and from the effects of climate change. For those millions of human beings, uncertainty and fear are their daily lot. Inequality has deprived many societies of hope and of opportunity. These crushed dreams and this lack of any hope in the future is exploited by some to further divide our communities, stirring up racism, xenophobia and violence which represent the very antithesis of the purpose of the Charter that we adopted in 1945. Your Excellencies, none of us can be unmoved by human suffering. War, conflict, economic crises and the environmental degradation affect us all, irrespective of rank or circumstance. We live in an interconnected world, leaving us no choice but to pursue global dialogue and a multilateral response. For this reason, I have proposed that we regalvanize the multilateral agenda with a rekindled sense of purpose on the basis of three principles, global leadership, shared responsibilities, and collective action. Global leadership to identify joint solutions to global problems and to take the appropriate and timely decisions to solve said problems. Shared responsibility because we all have a common cause, that of nurturing social cohesion and human dignity, but also of protecting the health and well-being of our planet. And collective action because the most sensitive problems facing humanity are of concern to all of us. I would invite you to draw inspiration from the ancient Andean principle of Minga, which refers to collective construction and shared labor to derive benefit for the entire community. Let us therefore forge a global Minga movement for the construction of more peaceful and equitable societies, societies that are more sustainable and resilient. Your Excellencies, this year I ask you to work together around seven priorities. The first priority of this General Assembly will be gender equality and the empowerment of women, a debt that we owe to more than half of the world's population and in its current state an injustice that acts as an impediment on global development. Achieving the economic and productive inclusion of women could add an, a further 11% to global GDP by 2025. Most regrettably, violence against women persists in all regions of the world. Girls are still not offered full access to quality information and education, tools which help to break down inequalities. 
The second priority shall be the implementation of the new global agreements on migration and refugees for the well-being of those 260 migrants and the almost 25 million refugees who have been ripped from their homes by conflict and violence. The creation of decent work opportunities for all, for every man and every woman, is the third priority, and it represents one of the most significant challenges for public policy making, for development, and for the sustainability over the long term of our social security and welfare systems. Fourth, we shall work to ensure due and proper attention is paid to the protection of the environment and to making headway in implementing agreements to curb climate change, including the Paris Agreement. Extreme heat waves, forest fires, storms and floods are leaving in their wake a trail of death and devastation. In August of this year, Kerala State in India suffered its worst monsoon floods in recent history leaving 400 dead and driving a million more from their homes. Hurricanes have killed more thousands of persons in 2017, making them one of the most deadly extreme weather phenomena in history. We bear a responsibility to reverse, as a matter of urgency, policies and patterns of production and consumption that are killing our planet. I have proposed highlighting the problem of plastic pollution to shed light upon this as a widespread environmental issue and threat which affects the health and the well-being of people around the world. The flotsam and jetsam of plastic waste in the Pacific Ocean measures more than four times the size of Germany. It is three times larger than France, and it represents a silent but very present threat to the Pacific coasts of the United States. The fifth priority is the importance of firming up political and social commitment to persons with disability and delivering on that commitment. There is still a need to heighten awareness about the specific needs of this group in society. Accessibility, inclusive and quality education and dignified jobs are challenges faced by the planet's largest minority to wit persons with disabilities. Priority number six will be the revitalization of the United Nations, and here we shall work on three tracks. The implementation of the reforms to the system, the strengthening of the process of revitalization of the General Assembly to optimize its methods of work and to expand its deliberative and decision-making role, and thirdly, we shall continue with the reform process of the Security Council as a reflection of the will and determination of states. Priority number seven shall be peace and security and the role of young people in conflict prevention. This assembly must set itself the lofty goal of becoming the chief peace-building body in the world following a preventive approach. Lasting peace and sustained peace must be rooted in dialogue and understanding. Facil facilitating such a dialogue will be my top priority the General Assembly must champion initiatives to ensure that young people enjoy greater opportunities and a greater role in political participation to avoid abandoning them to a path that leads inexorably to violent extremism. Your Excellencies, peace and security are one of the cornerstones of the work of this House, the United Nations. The most bitter conflicts and disputes are resolved through dialogue, through rapprochement, through generosity and through mutual understanding, and that includes when the differences of opinion are religious or cultural. Over the last few months, some of you gathered here today have taken significant and welcome steps towards understanding and peace, which should encourage your peers and should be hailed by us all. In July, the President of Eritrea and the Prime Minister of Ethiopia signed a joint declaration on peace and friendship to put an end to decades of conflict between those two countries. The drums of war have been silenced and diplomatic relations and ties of transport, trade and communication are being steadily resumed. Similarly, recently, the Panmunjom Declaration for the Peace, Prosperity and Unification of the Korean Peninsula was adopted between the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Both nations agreed to work together to put an end to decades of war and of conflict. This represents a historic milestone presaging a new era of peace and presaging the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. 
Both of these events cause hope to burn bright in a world in which many conflicts still lack a peaceful solution. Your Excellencies, the challenges taken up by the Charter of the United Nations have evolved. The threats of climate change, the disappearance of biodiversity, human trafficking, environmental pollution, mass displacement, both of migrants as well as of refugees, terrorism and ethnically based conflicts are now at the top of our agenda. We have passed headlong into a technological and digital era which has led to economic, social and cultural exchanges that were not even dreamed of a scant few decades ago and which pose also challenges which this organisation will have to be better positioned to meet. It is for that reason that we have to make progress in the implementation of the reforms to the United Nations system that are proposed. We want a more efficient and open rather than tone-deaf organization that reflects the political and economic reality of a changing world. The leadership and commitment of the states and of the Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, is a boon when it comes to taking decisive steps towards these reforms of the UN system. We must hold to our vision and commitment to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Only by thus doing can we ensure that all people can live in dignity and in peace. I would invite you to pay particular attention to the vulnerabilities of those countries in unique and special situations where extra efforts must be made in order to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm speaking here of small island developing states, landlocked countries and least developed countries, all of whom, as individual nations and groups, should benefit from the fruit of our shared responsibility to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Your Excellencies, I affirm my commitment to Africa and its peoples. We will do our utmost to speed up the achievement of the Africa Development Programme. Let us not simply talk about Africa, but let us act together with Africa. One of the outstanding challenges before this organization is that of achieving a definitive and lasting peace in the Middle East through the implementation of the resolutions that we have adopted within this assembly. Excellencies, this year we commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The flight for human rights remains a challenge in the world. Seventy years ago, a great woman led the work of the Human Rights Commission in charge of drafting the Universal Declaration, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. One of her phrases illustrates in a simple way why we must work to bring this organization and its decisions closer to our peoples. Mrs. Roosevelt pointed out, and I quote, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet, they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world." End of quote. Excellencias, quisiera your Excellencies, I would like to inaugurate the 30, 73rd session of the General Assembly with a heartfelt appeal to the leaders of the world to rise to meet the needs of our people and to not lose heart in your attempts to forge a more peaceful world, a safer world and a more humane world where every person can find their place with dignity. In so doing, let us proceed to build a United Nations that shall be more relevant to all people. Thank you very much.